Today's show is sponsored by Janice Henderson Investors. In an environment where allocators face more questions than answers, having a trusted partner is critical. Janice Henderson Investors is committed to building partnerships with institutional investors based on collaboration, insights, and transparency with the goal of helping clients generate desired investment outcomes. With 26 offices and 350 investment professionals worldwide, Janice Henderson has the scale to offer global perspective across equities, fixed income, and alternatives, and the depth to offer local expertise and support for clients. To learn more about partnering with Janice Henderson, visit JaniceHenderson.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Northern Trust's Investment Data Science. Harness the power of data science to turn data into insights with Northern Trust's Investment Data Science. Through a network of partnerships, Northern Trust's capabilities offer a curated suite of solutions, including EDS, Essentia Analytics, and Venn by Two Sigma, which combine Northern Trust's foundational data with data science and behavioral analytics that help asset managers and asset allocators optimize their investment process to deliver enhanced outcomes. Visit northerntrust.com slash IDS to learn more. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. Every so often, I share my thoughts on investing from the other side of the mic. And occasionally, those ideas are different from what I've shared in the past. Recently, I appeared on the Opto Sessions Interviews with Extraordinary Investors podcast hosted by Hayden Brain. Opto identifies key themes and ideas to help investors get exposure to structural growth trends through a daily newsletter, magazine, and podcast. Hayden asked me some great questions that cover the difference in retail and institutional investing, aspects of my professional experience, insights from my conversations with Sam Zell, Joel Greenblatt, Chamath Palihapitiya, Mike Novogratz, and Dan Rasmussen, investing for the long term, and reflections on the Buffett bet. Before we get going, this week, have you noticed the sweeping changes in professional golf? The long-standing PGA Tour had effectively an incentive fee-only model. Along came Live Golf, offering robust management fees, and in short order, the PGA responded with management fees of its own. I wrote about the parallels in a recent blog entitled, Live Golf is Asset Management in Reverse. Check it out on our website at capitalallocators.com slash Ted's hyphen blog, or for ease of access, click down under the more menu. Read it, tell a friend, and for an early look, join our premium membership for the price of a few weeks worth of coffee. Thanks again for spreading the word. I hope you enjoy my turn on the other side of the mic with Hayden Brain from the Opto Sessions podcast. Welcome. It's great to have you on the show. So how are things? Thanks, Hayden. Uh, Everything's going really well. Very exciting times in lots of different ways. (laughs) Yeah, very much so. Markets are keeping us busy. uh, So I'm sure it's the same for you as well. Um, so I'd like to start by asking a question that won't necessarily flow chronologically, but it will give listeners an early indication of one of the focuses of today's interview. Uh, Capital Allocator's mission statement, as it reads on your website, is learn, share, and implement the process of premier investors by compounding knowledge and relationships. So to what extent do you think it's possible for retail investors to imbibe, take on, and actually replicate the processes of these elite investors? It's a great starting point. You know, my history in the business is on the institutional side. So I was an institutional investor for 20 plus years. And most of the work I do on the podcast focuses on the institutional market. That said, it's a fun question to answer because I now invest as effectively a retail investor, right? I don't have the resources I once did. I'm not managing billions of dollars like I once did. So I, I think. A good way to answer that is to break it down into two components. 
So the first is there are definitely uh, ways that institutions invest that are, that are just not appropriate for retail because retail can't compete. And the way to think about that has to do with resources. So if you're managing billions of dollars, you can spend a fair amount of money that may be more than an individual even has in, in the research process of sort of mining for returns. And that's true both in the world I lived in, which is allocating to managers, as well as a money manager themselves. So if you take out, say, stock market investing, which now there's a lot more democratization of information, and it may be plausible for a retail investor to do many of the things an institutional investor would do. Things like venture capital and private equity and real estate investing all require a lot of resources to either find the deals or to find the managers who are conducting those deals globally. Um, those investment areas, the winners tend to be very plugged in and networked in their space. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for those types of investment strategies to take hold for a retail investor. So there's one side of it where if you think about it in terms of what types of investing requires resources to compete effectively, a fair amount of that is just not appropriate for retail. The other side is the way people invest. And a lot of that comes down to behavior. It's behavior, it's temperament, it's decision-making theory, it's understanding competitive advantage and where it is. And all of the lessons from that are very applicable to retail investors as well. Perfect. And we're going to get into some of those behavioral sort of processes and mindset characteristics later on in the episode. But let's circle back now to introduce you to any listeners that aren't aware of your work and your current sort of career history to date as well. Um, I did some research before the call and I read that you began your career in 1992 under the tutelage of David Swenson at the Yale University Investments Office. So, I mean, it, it strikes me that that would be almost a perfect education and grounding for a future investment career. Was that the case? Absolutely. I wouldn't say I knew it at the time. Mm. You know, you could look back and say, wow, that was early days for that style of investing. But there are very few true goats in the investing world mm -hmm. in the style. And there's no doubt that, that this style of multi-manager investing across asset classes, David is the goat. And not only was he the goat for many, many years himself and his team, he also was the goat in terms of training talent. Mm -hmm. And the people I worked with, ostensibly all, have had just tremendous investment careers. So take an Andy Golden at Princeton University's endowment or Paul Valent, who had incredible returns at Bowdoin for a long time, is now at Rockefeller University. Helen Schumann, who I worked with, who ran Carnegie Corp for years and trained Kim Liu, who's now at Columbia University, and Meredith Jenkins at Trinity Wall Street. And then the list goes on. Seth Alexander at MIT and Ann Martin at Wesleyan and Randy Kim, who's now uh, at Rainwater and Rob Wallace at Stanford. We all were trained in the same discipline, and there are literally no examples of someone who was trained by David, who stayed in the business, who didn't succeed. So there was mm -hmm. an incredible training ground that came out of that, and it was, on top of that, just a really fun environment. Uh, he was a wonderful like, culture carrier, and he was just an incredible couple of years. I spent five years with him then. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, well, let's continue working through your career, and we'll cycle forward to 2002. Uh, you were founder of Protégé Partners, serving as president and co-CIO at the time. I read that it was an alternative investment firm. I think you're investing and seeding small hedge funds. So how did you come to focus on that specific area of the market? So my path was, I went from Yale to Harvard Business School, and then I went into direct investing, and actually mostly in the private market. So much of my time at Yale was around public equity, broadly defined, you know, long only U.S., international emerging markets, some hedge fund stuff. And then I spent time as a direct, more private investor at two different private equity shops, also a little bit of public equity investing. And so then the question is, when you have that broad of a background, like, what do you do with it? Mm. And at the time, David had written his seminal work, Pioneering Portfolio Management, in 2000. So I, I worked for him from 92 to 97. I went to business school till 99, and then his book comes out. So I'm tolling away, trying to learn the direct investment business. Did not have the, the same quality of mentor in that business than I had working for David. And all of a sudden, people started calling me because he became famous overnight. Nobody knew who he was other than within the industry when I worked there. And so I thought about 
wanting to go back to multi-manager investing. And hedge funds had a combination of two things. First, incredible flexibility. So if I had to focus in one area, why not focus in something that was really broad Mm. uh, from an investment perspective? So as an investor, I don't want to be confined to a box. And that was sort of how I learned to invest. I wanted to keep doing that. Um, And the other was, it was pretty clear at that moment in time, hedge funds had a pretty unique period, particularly long short equity hedge funds in the popping of the dot-com bubble. Mm -hmm. But today we would call a factor bet. Many long short hedge funds were long value and short high flying growth and did exceptionally well when markets did poorly. Mm -hmm. Then also around the same time, David wrote his book, which had sort of an institutional prescription for how to adopt these asset classes for boards. Um, And it was pretty clear that there was more and more interest in the hedge fund area. And I had the opportunity to to co-found a business around that and took some of the disciplines I learned at Yale and then tried to apply it in hedge funds. So that was the path for me to starting Project Partners. Yeah, fantastic. And I think during that time, uh, 2010, I believe, Larry Kochar profiled you in the book, uh, Top Hedge Fund Investors. So obviously, you know, not a bad place to be, I'm sure among pretty uh, high esteemed company in that book. Um, The fund must have been performing particularly well at the time. I I imagine I didn't see any performance figures, but how how did you kind of manage that outperformance, you know, it was around the time of the financial crisis, just after, talk to us about that time. We had a pretty cool mousetrap. Um, so when we started Protégé, what we did was say, we're going to build a portfolio of our favorite hedge fund investments mm-hmm. and then have seeding some funds on top of it. The focus of Protégé was investing in smaller funds. Yeah. Many of those were early stage, but smaller. And so you had a couple of strategic advantages. I mean, Hedge funds generally are thought of as capacity-constrained strategies. I should say were. That world has changed a lot in the last, whatever that is, 20 years in terms of how people can be competitively advantaged in the space. But back then, it was this idea, size is the enemy of performance. Hedge funds are capacity-constrained. And so if you were smaller, you could imagine having a broader opportunity set and a little bit of a competitive advantage. And then on top of that, because we were accustomed to investing early on in funds, sometimes we had the opportunity to back someone and have our fund earn economics in their business as well. Mm. So you had effectively a well-selected portfolio of hedge funds plus a call option on business growth. And nobody else had that. So you could pay for your fees. And some of it a result of that, some of that a result of the disciplines and the, and the success, and there's always luck involved. We had, yeah, we had returns that were you know, near the top of the industry for the first decade we were in the business. Um, Through the financial crisis was pretty interesting. Mm. We had a view a few years before that the credit markets were quite rich. And we had been short some high yield, which paid off a little bit in 2008, but it wasn't a great risk reward. And came across the subprime short, the subprime mortgage short in 2006. And it was a very easy transition, right? We were shorting through managers, but we were shorting bonds that were paying eight to 10% a year thinking we were going to make 30 or 40. Mm -hmm. And then we get a proposition that you can pay eight to 10% a year and make 10 times your money. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that hard to think that, you know, real estate could be, you know, at its its peak. So it was the only time I would say my entire investment career that I felt like I slept well, because Mm -hmm. I knew that if the world kept going the way it was, we were going to keep delivering returns. And if something changed, we had this incredible levered hedge. Uh, so we had just a remarkable year in 2007. Um, we took some pain in 2008, but much less than, than many of the other people. We also didn't perform quite as well as 2009 because it's hard to pivot one of those books. We did as much as we could. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we did fine in 2009. So yeah, so through that, that period from when we started until, you know, I guess at least 2010, we, we had performed exceptionally well. Yeah, fantastic. No, I didn't know about the subprime debt as well. So that's really interesting. And then if we cycle forward six years from that 2010 point, we're in 2016, I guess you collate a lot of the experience uh, in the years preceding that to write your first book. So you want to start a hedge fund lessons for managers and allocators. Um, So through the podcast, you've since shared investment insights and education prodigiously. I think you're over 400 episodes at this point. But what initially sparked that vocation to educate and to offer insights, do you think? I think it's genetic. Mm. So my, my, my mother was a preschool teacher. My father's a doctor who also taught mm. his whole career. 
My sister's an educator. My brother's a business guy, but had thought about going back and teaching. So it's just something I enjoy. I enjoy sharing what I know as much, if not more, than just the practice of making money. Mm. Uh, that's it's just a little bit different than I think a lot of people in the business, and it's um, it's just something I I derive a lot of benefit from. So it, it sort of started with that. I think that was part of it. On the first book, it was also sort of the end of a chapter of my career, and I knew that. So when I decided to leave Protege, I really no longer believed we could deliver in the way we had in the past. Mm. Um, small hedge funds were at this sort of inflection of feeling like the supply and demand for capital was no, no longer in their favor. And so I was seeing better and better talent than we had seen in the past be open to, say, a seeding relationship with less and less of a prospect of those people having additional capital beyond the seed. Right. And so it just felt like it was going to be harder and harder. Mm. Um, public markets in particular were just felt like the information was catching up. Mm. Short interest kept getting higher and higher. And so it was just harder to have as much conviction going forward. At the same time, what happened was lots and lots of managers would come to me for advice. And I found that unlike in, say, venture capital, the ecosystem around hedge funds has no information base of entrepreneurship. Because if somebody starts a successful hedge fund, they never start another business. So mm. there's no opportunity to say, I'm a serial entrepreneur in hedge mm. funds. But I had this rare seed, right? We had seeded 40 funds. So I had seen funds go through the startup process 40 times and often make subtle mistakes that were the same. Mm. Now, not one person making the same mistake twice, but different people. Mm. And so the next person that came in had nowhere to learn what some of those lessons were. And so I found myself repeating the same conversations. Maybe it was about marketing. Maybe it was about forming their team. Maybe it was about their strategy. Maybe it was about how quickly do they put positions on. And in every one of those things, it's almost like I had seen a little playbook play out of some things that were successful and some things that weren't. But I didn't want to be in the business anymore. I just didn't want to spend my time having the same conversation. So I said, well, I'll just write it down. Mm. And it'll benefit the people who want to fight that uphill battle because it was, it was always an uphill battle, but it was a steeper uphill climb to succeed as a startup hedge fund. And if people want to do it, great. Here's everything I know. Let me, let me just put that down. And so that was the impetus for writing that first book. Yeah, great. And well, you've continued that education, those insights in launching the Capital Allocators podcast in 2017. Um, in, I read in April earlier this year, uh, you surpassed 10 million downloads, which is obviously a fantastic, a massive milestone for the show and obviously testament to, to the engagement you get there as well. So you've gone on to um, interview some of the top uh, investors out there, some of the most elite, well-known, high-profile investors out there. You've been named on Barron's Business Insider Forbes as one of the top investing podcasts as well. So why do you think it's proved such a success? What do you think about your show particularly resonates with listeners to such a degree? Yeah, there was clear accidental product market mm -hmm. fit, right? I never went into this thinking it would be the cornerstone of how I spent my time, which it has become. Um, I think there's, there's two parts of it. One is in any form of this type of media, there's an element of access. And so I didn't, again, I didn't appreciate it at the time because when I started the show, I just said, well, I'm just going to catch up with a bunch of my friends in the business. And I had been on a few podcasts for my first book. That's kind of how I came to it. Um, and it just turned out that many of the people I knew from the business, and particularly the CIO side, there's no forum for them to go out and tell their story mm. for an hour. It just didn't exist. And I didn't really appreciate that. It was For me, it was more like, oh, I'll just have some fun conversations, catching up with some friends I hadn't had time to catch up with when I was running around looking at hedge funds. Um, so there was this product market fit in terms of sharing the kinds of conversations that I had throughout my career, but just more broadly. Um, I think if you attach that to, let's just say passion. I mean, I absolutely love having conversations with smart people about investing. That's what I've done my entire career. The output mechanism is a little different, right? I used to turn that, put it into portfolios, have capital and raise money. And now it's just a conversation that I get to share publicly. I kind of like the aspect of it that I no longer have to have my evaluation hat on. Mm -hmm. Right? So I don't have an ulterior motive when mm. I'm sitting there saying, do I think this manager is smart? Do I want to have another yeah. conversation? Let me ask them a question that'll really like push them hard and see how they react. Whereas this is just like, hey, it, it's just storytelling yeah. to some extent. And I just love it. And I think it's something that for whatever reason I found I, I do pretty well. 
And so you put together the kind of the product market fit in terms of the content that's there and then just how much I enjoy the people I'm talking to and having those conversations. And I, my guess is that's what's happened. There's, I'm sure there's also an element of, call it beta, yeah. of timing and luck when I started it and you know, podcast growing and COVID probably helped. Like I didn't know initially, but probably broadened the yeah. audience because you had different listening yeah. patterns and now you have both. Now you have people that are commuting again and people who aren't. And so it's, there's always an element of luck. I wouldn't want to oversell like the alpha component of it, but it's a little bit of both. Why don't we dig into the podcast then and get into some of the interviews that you've had over the last couple of years or so. And I want to start by, I suppose, picking uh, interviews that I think uh, align to a particular investment theme. Uh, and then, you know, we can talk about the interview, talk about any anecdotes you have from your time speaking to that person, but then hopefully we can open it out into a broader conversation about that theme. So let's start with uh, when you spoke to investing legend Sam Zell, uh, often labeled a grave dancer and major contrarian. Uh, during the interview, he referenced Buffett, who said, and I'm sure most people have heard this quote, buying when no one else wants to buy creates opportunity. So after over 400 episodes or so by now, how central has contrarianism been to the philosophies of all of those elite investors you've spoken to over the time? You know, David Swenson first articulated particularly for institutions, this idea that, that successful investing for institutions demands non-institutional behavior. Mm. And contrarianism is now like a term. Um, what does that mean? I guess it means doing things other people don't want to do, going against the herd. Sam's a fabulous person to talk to about that for a couple of reasons. First is he just is able to distill complex things in very simple ways with a tremendous amount of common sense where, you know, he just talks, well, it's about supply and demand. Mm. The second is he's incredibly irreverent. I mean, people that, that I know that it introduced me to him, everyone was stunned that he didn't swear profusely on the podcast. So apparently that's kind of his more day-to-day -day demeanor. But he just, he has that mindset that he doesn't really care that much. Some of it you could tell is from his background, a very interesting, unique background and childhood. Um, and then, you know, I think at the end of the day, some of it has to do with the capital behind you. This is where retail investors can have an advantage over institutions. Institutions have boards, they have committees, they have all these things that come in the way between an individual saying, I want to make this investment and an answer at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, and, and, and individuals don't necessarily have that. They have their own behavioral challenges. We all do. Um, but those get compounded in institutions. So take as an example, Sam's most recent push in markets about two, three years ago was in energy. Institutions were going the other way, right? There was ESG, people were talking about divestment. And Sam looked at supply and demand and said, look, oil use isn't going away ever. And he didn't have someone sitting over his head saying, no, oil is bad, you can't do it. Now you have the war in Ukraine and all of a sudden the institutions realize, well, we need yeah. oil. Let's, let's talk about net zero and not divestment, right? All yeah. the same goal. And my guess is right now he's probably plowing into refiners, right? Still, yeah. the institutional behavior wouldn't let people play that much in the energy ecosystem. Those are slow moving investment decisions with boards where he's saying, oh, the bottleneck's now in refiners. Let's go from EMP production to, to refinery. So that's contrarianism. But for yeah. him, it's common sense. It's the absence of barriers preventing him from doing stuff or looking bad. And then it's the fundamentals of supply and demand where he sees there are gaps. And so sometimes people think of contrarianism as new investment strategies or doing things of people differently. But investing's gotten much more sophisticated than it was when I started my career. So what was thought of as being contrarian 30 years ago now is common sense to a lot of people. So a lot of it more is now behavior than it is necessarily the, the new market. Yeah, got it. And what was interesting to me was how he talked about how he built up conviction to go against the market or to have that contrarian position, which, I mean, as you've already alluded to, seemed to come quite naturally to him. I don't think he was too phased by that. And maybe that comes with experience. But do you have any insight as to how retail investors can conjure that same conviction, that same confidence? Look, Seth Klarman refers to value investing as the combination of a contrarian streak and a calculator. Mm -hmm. um, the harder part for retail investors is time. 
Yeah. Right. When we think of retail investors, we don't think of it as they're spending all day, every day doing analysis. But in the markets, particularly in the public markets, you're competing against people who are. Mm. Um, so it's very, very hard to compete at the level of analysis. Where retail investors that are doing it themselves can benefit is understanding what do they know well mm. and what is their individual competitive advantage and then trying to figure out a way to express that within their portfolio. Um, and that's where you get conviction. You get conviction from knowledge. And that knowledge can be doing the work or it could be you know, your experience. Um, Someone works in a particular industry they actually know a lot more about the industry than a money manager outside the industry probably does. So they're spending their time and knowledge that way. But that's how you get conviction. It's from doing the work in whatever form that takes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's move on to uh, another interview uh, you did in November 2020. So going back a little bit in time, uh, you spoke to Joel Greenblatt, legendary and value investor and founder of Gotham Capital, of course. Uh, he offered some fascinating insights around portfolio construction um, during your interview, uh, he talked about the uh, concentration of his portfolio. I think he referenced six to eight ideas that accounted for over 80% of his exposure at the time. Uh, again, reflecting on the hundreds of conversations you've had with elite money managers today, how should investors think about portfolio construction? Is there an optimum level of diversification, do you think? A lot of people miss the forest through the trees. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of these conversations, I pick up incremental nuggets, but there aren't that many where I'm exposed to a framework that is novel and, for me, mind-blowing. But that happened recently. So I had a, a conversation on the podcast with Ashwin Chabra, who manages the family office for Jim Simons of Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And before that, he was the head of private wealth at Merrill Lynch. So he spent his career really on the private wealth side before turning to institutional investing. And he developed a framework for thinking about really the goal of, for, in this case, individuals. And it was different from how we think of asset allocation, concentration, diversification. His framework was three pillars. And the first was stability. So you could think about cash, you think about reserves, all the things that make sure you're stable in life. The second was just the market portfolio. And the third he called the aspirational portfolio. So to think about the aspirational portfolio is something you're using to move the needle to move to a new wealth bracket. So often that might be an entrepreneurial venture, a big bet on a particular company. And the reason I bring it up is because that issue of concentration versus diversification somewhat should take into light where are you sitting in those tiers? Because ostensibly all of the conversations I have are variations of a theme of the market portfolio. What Joel did in his, early, his first iteration of Gotham, having six to eight concentrated positions well-researched, is effectively an aspirational type portfolio. It's taking very well-researched big bets on things. And not only were they six to eight positions, but he took as much risk as he could. He used to use mm -hmm. leaps instead of just cash you know, securities or stocks. Um, and they compounded at 50% a year for 10 years, and then he retired. And the Gotham now that he has, which is a business, which is diversified portfolios over his little book, you know, cash, high ROAC businesses and things like that, that's more of a market portfolio, hopefully plus. Mm -hmm. So I think it's in that context that people need to think about how much concentration or diversification is valuable. When you're talking about just getting access to that market portfolio, diversification is the ultimate free lunch. Mm -hmm. Right to go from one stocks to twelve, to go from the U.S. market to an international market, to go from private markets to public markets, and have pieces of all of the global portfolio. The more you get that, the more you're getting at that return and minimizing your risk along the way. It's when you want to go into the aspirational portfolio that you think about taking a lot more risk for the potential to really move the needle. Yeah, got it. And uh, he he shared his kind of portfolio management philosophy. I think shortly after saying that uh, the key to sizing his positions was to look down, not up. So I guess that feeds into what you're saying. You know, It's all about thinking about risk first and the downside first, I suppose. Yeah. There's an interesting thing I've learned recently. So we started actually doing some AI work on assessing the conversations of the podcast to try to see different themes. And one of the things we found is that the allocator community, so the CIOs talk a lot more about risk mm. and the managers talk a lot more about upside, returns, um, growth, words like that. So yeah. I think 
it depends where you sit in the food chain of how you think about it. Um, Part of it's incentive structures too, right? A money manager is often paid for their incentive fee as the upside. And there's Mm -hmm. particularly, say, a hedge fund structure. There's asymmetric gain to them for generating returns versus losing money. Whereas the allocator seat tends to be a more salary-based, salary plus bonus-based seat. And so it's hard to know exactly the cause and effect. Uh, But it is interesting relative to the goals that somebody has. People tend to focus much, much more on return than risk. Mm. Return is easy to measure. Risk is hard to measure, even after the fact. Um, Mm. And so I think Joel's framework was really, really interesting. Right Now, notice he didn't say how much risk he was taking. He was just saying, understand what your downside risk is and what you can tolerate. And that helps you size you know, the upside of the return. But I'll move us on to uh, another of your most popular episodes, or at least it was on YouTube. Uh, you had a conversation with v- VC, SPAC sponsor and founder of Social Capital, Chamath Polyapatia. Uh, Chamath talks about uh, Buffett again, uh, but how he accelerated his own worldview, uh, which seems to be largely centered around US exceptionalism. I think that's fair to say. Uh, He voted with his dollars through the investments he's made at Berkshire. And I guess Chamath was talking about how he was trying to do a similar thing. It was a fascinating insight. But firstly, having spoken to the Oracle of Omaha yourself, which we'll get onto in a second, is that a view you share? Do you think that's what Buffett was trying to do? Um, I don't know. Uh, That's certainly the the output of it. You know, he he does talk a lot about (coughs) circle of competence. Yeah. Um, and rule of law is something you hear a lot in the, in the professional investment world about why many U.S.-based investors are a lot more comfortable. Everything from stock markets to distressed debt investing and understanding the bankruptcy code, uh, less so these days in, in the private markets, but people have a, mm. a very different view, say, in U.S. private equity than in China. Um, yeah. So I think some of it is, is comfort level. Um, but you know, Warren does have this underlying belief that the U S is the best, you know, country for capitalism. And so I think it's probably a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. Completely see what you mean. Uh, well, I mean, it struck me as interesting. I kind of, in my, in my notes, put it under a, a, a heading of impact or thematic investing, because I guess if you're at that level, you're investing for your own worldview as, as Chamath put it, but to kind of bring that down a notch to what a retail investor can actually possibly feasibly achieve, I guess they're not going to be able to do that, but perhaps they can invest with some or in line or aligned with some of their fundamental beliefs about where the world is headed. Uh, But crucially as well, I think obviously they want to still make money. So I just wondered from your perspective, do you think those two things can be properly aligned, you know, investing with your fundamental beliefs aligned with those beliefs, but also crucially outperforming and making money as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many different ways to express investment views in a relatively cost-efficient way yeah. that are available today that weren't you know, 20 years ago. The entire ETF world, as an example. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's important. Like, So much of investing, people focus on return and maybe the next level beating the market. That tends to be less important, ultimately, than what are people trying to achieve. Mm. Or what's the purpose of the money for them? Um, and outperformance, you get to this market portfolio, and that's something we all now can access really, really easily and compound and own the growth of the US or the world um, through ETFs. And so then the question becomes, if you're trying to outperform, does it matter or is it just a fun game? Both of which are fine, by the way. Mm-hmm. Like I found if I'm not doing things in the markets, it's less stimulating to me. I, I just enjoy it, even if I'm subtracting value over time. Mm. Like it just adds to my um, intellectual curiosity and yeah. all those types of yeah, things yeah. that come. So mm. the short answer to yes, it's it's very plausible to express worldviews through investing, and it's easy to do. And I think that can be important to some people if that's what they choose to do. And others, it may not be important. Well, let's move on to uh, another theme that's brought out uh, crucially in your book. So your, your book was uh, released last year, published last March, I believe, uh, Capital Allocators, How the World's Elite Money Managers Lead and Invest. Um, and it distills the key lessons from the first 150 episodes, I think, of your podcast. And one theme mentioned within that book is market dynamics. 
it's a section where you bring out sort of key nuggets or quotes from the people that you've spoken to. And Michael Novogratz said, great bubbles happen around great stories. So I found that particularly interesting given his focus on cryptocurrencies. Anyone that knows him will know that that's very much his focus. Uh, do you recall what bubble he was actually talking about as part of that episode? The quote, I think, is broadly yeah. applicable. That he was yeah. thinking about that. You know, the dot-com bubble had a great story about the revolution of the internet. Um, in this case, he was talking about cryptocurrencies and, and blockchains. Um, and there, you know, there is a great story, right, of what's happened with the concentration of power and yeah. the internet and how the, the, the people who are supplying the tools are not the ones getting rewarded to a change in the incentive structure. So there's a great narrative around mm -hmm. blockchain technologies. And, you know, part of that was, hey, maybe I did that interview a couple of years ago. So the bubble wasn't at the apex that it had hit. No. You know, at the, sort of towards the end of last year. No. Um, but there is a great story around it. And it's a question of whether that story will get fulfilled ultimately with the technology and the applications that get developed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it interests me because I did see when you did the interview and obviously we've reached a, a peak and somewhat of a downturn since that point. And, you know, after the recent turbulence we've seen in crypto, I was interested to get your view on on your kind of long term outlook. Maybe not for cryptocurrency or Bitcoin in particular, but just di digital assets in general. Is that is that something? You know, are you similarly bullish? You, you know, you as bullish as Michael is on this stuff, or are you less? You know, you're less enthusiastic on the outlook. Well, I haven't bet my career on it, so I doubt I'm as bullish as he is. Mm. Um, so the framework that I have been thinking about the whole blockchain ecosystem is as follows. You have two things happening that are driving uh, innovation in, in that area. The first is this very novel incentive structure around tokens, um, which is pretty clear and people understand that tokens, the way they get disseminated, the people actually doing the work can get rewarded. Mm -hmm. um, the other is, is this concept of how innovation happens and where it happens. So if you look back, I mean, iPhone came out roughly, I guess it was just 15 years ago. So you look back 20 years ago, the technologies we use commonly today didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's likely to be the case 20 years from now. Yeah. And the question is, where will whatever is new get built? And there's really only three different ways. One is it's sort of entrepreneurs building it on legacy systems. Mm -hmm. You have the giants. Now you have these giant technology companies with infinite resources. Maybe they build it internally on their own system. But in this case, you've got a new platform. Yeah. And what you hear from the venture capitalists in the space, like you know, Chris Dixon or Olaf Carlson, we will say, look, when they see all the entrepreneurial activity, all the, the talented new programmers are building things on the blockchain. We don't know what they'll build. We don't know exactly where the applications will come through. We can understand what a blockchain is. I, I don't program. I don't use blockchains. But I do understand, okay, it's this immutable ledger. and There's some value in that. There's certainly value in that with some of the frictions in the financial system. There's value in certain aspects of NFTs and connectivity between a creator and their, their fans. And so, at least today, you can understand some concepts. Then the question will be, that's a great story. Mm -hmm. Will those things get built? Will they get built in a usable way? The few times I've gone in to participate, buy an NFT with my son or something like that, I was stunned at like how difficult it was mm -hmm. for a novice mm. to actually engage in the platform. So those things will change. Those will get easier over time. Those, the digital wallets, everyone will have one over time. So I do think that it's likely that the new wave of technology innovation is happening on blockchains. The applications that we're using every day, the most powerful ones 20 years from now, may well come out of this Web3 ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a decade off. It's not two years off before we see it. And it's, there's a reason why most of this stuff is venture capital. Even though the tokens are priced, it's sort of venture capital being priced in a way that public markets do. Mm -hmm. And you can have from that a little bit of too short-term thinking. Um, but this is all venture capital type stuff that takes a decade or more to play out. I'm invested with Andreessen, for example, mm -hmm. um, in their fund. And, and I own some Bitcoin. I own more Ethereum today. So there's, there's a bunch of little simple ways that I try to participate yeah. in that. But it's a small percentage of you know, my portfolio. I just think 
the potential is there. Uh, it's a risky investment with the potential to do quite well. And then in these bubble periods, the future gets priced in. A yeah. successful future gets priced in. So it, it shouldn't be shocking that there'd some, be some big sell-off. And it could go down further from here. It could bounce back. It'll be very, very volatile. But over time, you know, even if you look today where Bitcoin's settled in for now in the you know, low 20,000s, yeah. that's significantly higher than it was three years ago. Yeah. And Four or five thousand, other than the first pop to seventeen, you know, back in uh, what was it, two thousand and seventeen? I guess mm -hmm. there was mm -hmm. a big pop to yeah. seventeen thousand, yeah. and then it dropped back down to three thousand. But those floors seem to get higher and higher as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's fascinating. I'll move us on to uh, a quote. Still, I think within the market dynamic section of of your book, but uh, I think it was Dan Rasmussen that said, "In times of easy money, a lot of stupid things work." A lot of unprofitable companies make massive increases in stock price. A lot of bad ideas get funded. And some of those bad ideas actually turn out to be good ideas. So if we label the previous decade as a period of, of easy money, in inverted commas, how, how do you think the next 10 years will be characterized? I mean, surely from my perspective, it, it can't be the same as that. Yeah, well, it's never the same. I, I like to say that the hardest day to invest is always today. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter when today is. It just always feels like it's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not very good at predicting the future. I'm much, much better at predicting the past. Um, but I think that the common wisdom is that it will be harder. Yeah. Right? Rates should normalize at a higher level, which means that the easy credit for the entire private equity ecosystem uh, is going to change. I mean, cost of capital will go up. So projects that companies participate in have to be better to be positive NPV and you just go so far down the line. Just means it's going to be harder to make money. That's not really priced into markets too much. Mm -hmm. Valuations from a historical multiple perspective are still high both in the public and private markets. Yeah. So that just means like it's probably going to be tougher sledding. Now that said, I would tell you that that narrative has been present um, I heard it the first time in 1992. Mm, yeah. At the beginning of a bull market, one of the very first manager meetings I had was with Jeremy Grantham, and he was talking about how you know, we were in for a period of lean returns. Mm -hmm. um, he happened to be wrong at that moment in time, very right other times. And it's certainly been the same narrative over the last 10 or 20 years, that things have been yeah. really good in financial assets for a while. They won't continue. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, you know, things keep going until they stop. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and things are cyclical. So yeah, I do expect it to be a tougher period of time with more volatility. And it's just really, really hard to know when that happens and what it looks like. Yeah, no, completely. Those false dawns have been called so many times before. It's almost, you, you end up second guessing yourself at this point. But yeah, completely agree. It, 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 it can't be the same, but ultimately maybe it's not as bad as everyone proclaims it might be, um, I guess, is, is a way to characterize it. Uh, no, that's really interesting. And the final quote I had for this market dynamic section was uh, from Ben Inker. He said, a lot of things become more predictable over a long time horizon. And I wanted to bring this in because we talk to uh, the readers and the subscribers to our newsletter about investing over a long term time horizon. We feel that is the more prudent thing to do. Uh, but from your perspective, how crucial is it that retail investors think about returns over a multi-year or even a multi-decade time horizon, do you think? Time horizons are a funny thing. Right? I I've yet to meet many people, if anyone, who believes that they innately have a short time horizon in their investing strategy. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I started my career at the opposite. You know, David Swenson was a guy who literally came into the office every day wearing the hat of someone who's investing for a hundred years. Um, mm -hmm. And almost every other week, somebody would be like, why are you so short term? It, it was just part of the language <laughs> of, of that. And when you're in that environment and you feel it, there's just a different pace and cadence and thought process than almost anybody I've met has since. Like nothing oh. ever matters today if you're investing for, you know, 100 years. Like literally nothing matters. Yeah. Market goes yeah. up, goes down 20%. There's a crash today. doesn't matter if you're investing for a really long period of time. So nobody's wired to behave that way. One of the things I've come to learn is that given the constraints that almost everyone has, an, an individual with their spending, an institution with their board, that the long term, if you can really think about it, probably gets to three to five years. 
Mm -hmm. um, in terms of long-term investing. Even private equity has, that has 10-year life funds, they tend to hold companies for three to five years. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm not sure if that's the right or not. Now, if someone is able to actually invest for a longer period of time than that, it's great. Um, we all think of that as like the elixir to great performance, but I'll tell you a story that's fine, but doesn't have the same outcome. So my father is a doctor. He's not an active investor. He's always followed the stock markets, but he, he buys and holds things. He owns IBM stock that he bought in 1959. Wow. Now I'm, it's up a lot, right? Yeah. It's, it's up a tremendous amount, but he probably would have done much better owning the market, which you couldn't do in 1959. There was no index fund. Mm -hmm. He certainly would have done a yeah. lot better if he had met Warren Buffett and owned Berkshire Hathaway. So mm -hmm. just because you have a long-term time horizon, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty long-term. I mean, he's owned the thing for 63 years. It's hard to get mm -hmm. longer term than that, but it doesn't mean that he has a great outcome either no. um, relative yeah. to other alternatives. So uh, there's no one, you know, people look for the answer in investing. And that's part of mm -hmm. what's so engaging about investing is there is no one answer and things change over yeah. time. And there's a combination of someone's individual disposition and what's appropriate and how they go about investing. That said, all the data shows that almost every investor is too short term mm -hmm. and makes similar mistakes about kind of chasing performance and whether it's stocks or managers. Yeah, perfect. No, I completely agree. Uh, and you mentioned Buffett there. Obviously, it's been almost a constant theme throughout the podcast. Buffett's name keeps cropping up. And I wanted to just finish on this. You raised a, a wager with with Buffett, uh, pretty famous. I think a uh, fair few of our listeners will have already heard about it, but I'm keen to get your insight as to kind of what went into that wager and how you reflect on the result of that as well. Um, but for anyone that doesn't know, it was made in 2008. It was a non-profitable wager made with Buffett. Uh, you pitted the 10-year performance of the S&P 500 against a selection of five hedge fund of funds uh, from the period 2008 to 2017. So, and we won't focus too much on the basics of this because I think it's been well covered elsewhere, but perhaps you can just give us a brief idea of what inspired you to make that bet in the first place. I had seen that Warren had made a statement about the market and, and hedge funds in the context of a very thoughtful discourse on fees. Mm -hmm. The problem with the statement he made was that hedge funds and the market aren't really the same thing. And he made it at a time when the market was trading at historically high valuation. So he made the statement in 2006. Right. And I just thought it was kind of too simple. Mm -hmm. I like to make things simple as possible, but no simpler. And um, so I wrote him a letter and there was a correspondence. Um, and so I think part of it was my belief at the time that you didn't want to own the market. Um, you don't always want to own the market. Most of the time, it's a good idea. If you have, as we said, a really, really, really long time horizon, mm -hmm. you're going to do fine. But history would have told you if you were buying the market at, you know, at the beginning of 2008, um, you wouldn't have expected to have a very good outcome. No. Um, whereas hedge funds through that time and probably since do fine. You know, they tend to make money. They don't make big, big money. Uh, you read about a hedge fund that makes big, big money, but hedge funds by and large are risk reduction, wealth preservation type vehicles mm -hmm. when done well. And so it was more of an idea that, you know, he said this thing, I think he's wrong. I'm in the hedge fund space at the time. So, you know, it's good to be able to promote that mm. and to say, you know, like, I, I just don't think he's right. Um, and so that was the impetus for it. It was a really, <laughs> it took on a life of its own in a way I, I wouldn't have fully anticipated at the time, but, it, um, but uh, that's how it started. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, uh, so you wrote that letter in 2007. How kind of optimistic were you of a response from Buffett? And I guess what I'm keen to pull out here is what do you think piqued his interest uh, most? I can't say I know what piqued his interest. In my first book, I put the original letter that I wrote in the book as a, as a sort of a a small lesson in how to capture someone's attention. Mm, nice. I really wrote the letter mostly out of curiosity because mm. I had heard from a number of friends who had corresponded with him in small ways that he was just he's absolutely brilliant at, and clever at how he responds to things. Mm. And so I was really just curious to see if he would respond and how, and sure enough, he did. Before we ever spoke, it turned into a very fun cat and mouse kind of <laughs> letter exchange of trying to figure out like, does he really want to do this? Do I really want to do this? Who, you know, who's sitting at the poker table? Who has the most chips? Like what, what, what are the terms going to be? So, um, 
Yeah, I just dropped him a letter literally in the mail um, and then got a note back from him some weeks later. Yeah, great. All right, well, let's get to the result of the, the bet. How, how do you reflect on that result in 2022? You know, I get asked about it a lot and I've thought about it a lot. Um, the result is less important to me than the process. Mm-hmm. Anytime you have an investment decision, there's only one outcome of many that could occur. And so the question is, most of the time when we have a bad outcome, which in this case, you know, it was bad. Let's say bad was losing the bet, which, which I did. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a bad outcome, you assume that was a bad process and, and vice versa. Um, I think it was actually exactly the opposite. I mean, I wrote a piece at the time that laid out my thesis. So it's one of the great decision-making tools you can do to improve decision-making is, is journal what you're thinking at the time. So then yeah. you can go back and reflect without, without the, the bias we all have to, to change our view of what happened at the time. And so, you know, I go back and look at that and I had, most things were right. And there were a few things that I thought that didn't come to pass that were wrong. And really what happened, you go about a year and a half into the bet and I think the hedge funds were up at one point about 50%. Um, mm-hmm. And that number, if you looked back historically at, at what the normal gap was between a market and the hedge funds, it was only like 1% or 2% a year. So the bet looked like it was over 14, 15 months mm-hmm. in. Um, in fact, Warren made some comments that gave me an indication of if he lost the bet, at least what he was going to say about starting points and ending points and time series as long as 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and so at the time, I put a very high probability assessment, maybe too high, but a high probability assessment on, on us winning. And if you went back and looked and said, you know, based on my thesis that the market would not perform well and hedge funds would do what they would do, um, those are two different return streams. Um, mm-hmm. If you looked at the market, GMO does their, you know, seven-year forecasts and they used to do mm-hmm. 10-year forecasts. And so I went back and asked Ben Inker, like, what was the probability that the market would make whatever did 7% a year based on the starting valuation in January 1, 2008? And the answer was 15%. So that part of handicapping was right. I had said we had an 85% chance of winning. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Now, the hedge funds did worse than I would have thought. And a big part of that was Fed coming in and interest rates dropping, which on a nominal basis hurts hedge fund returns and, and is inconsequential to public market returns. Uh, but you have a short yeah. rebate that goes from you know, making 3 or 4% a year to making zero, and that's a, a big hit on your returns. So there were a couple mm-hmm. of things that happened I couldn't have anticipated or didn't anticipate, maybe could have, couldn't have. Um, and I looked back and said, you know, that's a pretty good decision process. I also afterwards went back and asked Warren, hey, at the time, he said he had a 60% chance of winning. He talked about it afterwards, like it was fait complete, like he had a 100% chance of winning. And I, I asked him, like, do you remember, like, what were, was it valuation of the market? Well, he's like, yeah, I don't remember. I don't, I'm not sure. So I would say he won with the decision process that was questionable. We lost with a decision process that looked pretty good. Um, and that's how I think about it. Like, I, I would make that bet at the same time again. I think the odds were highly favorable of winning. Uh, it just didn't play out that way. Yeah, great. And that was, I was going to ask you, would you make that bet again? So that's, so that's really interesting. But um, in terms of the lessons, I suppose, again, our audience of retail investors can take from that, are there any insights that they can, they can extract from a process like that? Well, I think of the decision process, there's, there's plenty of insights mm. of sort of, you know, trying to map out why you're making a decision. Um, could you mm. have known more at the time? Could you know more the next time? Um, I, I do think there's a, you know, the high level lesson that Warren wanted to impart was, was basically right, which is it's just really, really mm-hmm. hard to beat the market. And yep. people at, at investing you know, as a retail investor, as an individual, and I do this myself, I have to think a lot about like, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish by investing? And if it mm-hmm. really is just to have more money at the end of the day, um, you have options that take zero time and cost zero money that can compound wealth. And I think, you know, yeah. Warren's tried to show that and has shown that for many, many years. Um, not within Berkshire Hathaway, right? Like it's, it's a funny thing where he has his annual meeting as an actively managed portfolio of a bunch of businesses and then tells people they should own index funds. Um, mm. But, I, you know, I think he, I think he showed that. Now, it, it, it might've been interesting if the outcome were different, like what would he have said? What would the impact of that have been? Um, but, you know, I think people have to think very carefully about what, what are they trying to accomplish with the money they have. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with saying, look, at the end of the day, investing in the market is something I enjoy. And hopefully I'll beat the market and I'm going to try to come up with a strategy to beat the market. But I'm just going to learn along the way. And there's value to me intrinsically for learning and 
doesn't matter if I'm beating the market. That's totally fine. Like people have to have their own disposition about you know, what they're doing and why. Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree. And it's not something we've talked about before, just that that kind of wanting to learn that inquisitive sort of curious nature of people to try and beat the market, even if the chances of doing that might be ultimately low. I mean, there's there's value in that process. No, I completely, completely uh, accept that and agree with that. Um, why don't we finish then with our quick fire questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. And these are a, a more generic list of questions that we ask all of our guests. Uh, so feel free to answer in as little as one sentence or even one word, if you like. The first one is simply, what is the most frequent mistake investors make, do you think? Chasing performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely a good one. Okay, question two. Where do you go for investment or economic insights? Do you read any specific publishers? When I write, we, we put it under a, a label, what Ted's thinking. We're, we're about to publish what Ted's reading. So there are about 25. <laughs> I've compiled... Uh, blogs, most of them are free um, that I read religiously. And wow. they, are, they generally are investing. Some are, some, a few are daily news. Some of them are more blogs. And so that's going to be our sitescapbiocares.com. That's going to come out probably this week or next week. Oh. So somewhere people could go to see. Um, I, it took me a couple of weeks to make sure I wasn't missing any of the obvious ones. Uh, but yeah, mm. so there's a long list. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, we'll include a link if that's published. Uh, When this goes out on Thursday, that will definitely be in the episode description. Question three, what is the most memorable moment from your career to date? This is often a tricky one, but let's let's see if there's one moment that particularly stands out. Wow. Um, There are a few. Uh, I guess guess I'd go back to the earliest one that I remember, which was the, the, the celebration that David gave me when I was leaving the investment office. He gave a little speech about what I had done and and the work I had done in the five years I was at Yale. And it kind of blew me away at how much, you know, we had accomplished in in five years I was there. I I remember that day vividly. Yeah, fantastic. I can imagine why that would stick long in the memory. Um, Our penultimate question then, uh, again, sort of backward looking, if you could go back in time, is there a top tip or bit of advice you would give to your younger self? Ask for help. Mm-hmm. Something I did yeah. not do readily. I still do not do readily, but um, but it's something that's incredibly important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, our final question, and this sort of the opto question, we aim to speak to people that are outperforming benchmarks or trying to do something different to outperform those benchmark returns. So we ask everyone that we speak to on the podcast, what is an investor's best source of alpha if you had to narrow it down to one thing? I think their own authentic competitive advantage. Mm. So what is it that is unique to you that um, gives you an advantage relative to other people? What is it that you do well that you know about that other people don't know as much? And so that's a good general framework for thinking about it. And I think that's what you find, that some people are wired in a certain way that have made them truly exceptional investors, a Warren Buffett, a Sam Zell. Um, doesn't mean you, you, most people can't be them. But you can be yourself and get the outcomes that you desire by figuring out what that is and how you can pursue that in the markets. Yeah, absolutely. And a fantastic insight to end on. That just leads me to say thank you very much for joining us on the podcast, Ted. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Hayden. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time. An important disclaimer from Janice Henderson Group, PLC. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal and fluctuation of value.